I hope that's where you live your life. More concerned about God think, what God thinks than what people think. Uh, welcome to the next gen department. How many next gen kids do we have in the room? Let's hear it from you. Come on now, that's ridiculous. Don't raise your hand, clap. If you're from next gen, if you would be upstairs. <laughs> I'll I tell you what, I've held class underneath where they meet and they're a lot noisier than that upstairs. I, uh, I'm glad to have our next gen students. We do a family worship experience three or four times a year and we invite kids to come together with moms and dads to be a part of our service here, which I think is a good thing. And it serves several purposes. It's a very positive thing for families to worship together. And then uh, maybe after uh, this week, moms and dads will have expressed their greater appreciation for next gen volunteers. Next Sunday, when they come back, you'll all of a sudden appreciate them on a whole new level. And uh, we're glad to have the kids in the service with us. And Becky's done a great job of providing some resources for the kids back there. If you didn't stop by the next gen booth, uh, you can do that. And uh, also a little snack or two for the kids. And uh, we're looking forward to having them be a part of this last Sunday in our family series. Uh, we have been together talking uh, about family over the last uh, four weeks. This is the fourth and final week of the series. And uh, so I'm glad that each one of you are here. Some of you are visiting with us for the holiday. Thanks for coming. And uh, we pray that the Lord will use this series uh, and this message to minister to you. And uh, if you'd like to go back and pick up some of what you've missed in these first three parts, you can do that at seymourfirst.com. That's our website where you can watch or listen online. And after today, there'll be three more weeks, three more weeks. And then uh, the old website, seymourfirst.com, will be fading away into the sunset and we'll be moving to our new name and our new logo and uh, our new uh, website. And you'll hear more about that uh, over these next two or three weeks as we make that transition. But uh, today we are wrapping up a series called Bless This Home. And our foundation for the series has been the Beatitudes. And uh, this is in Matthew chapter 5. And we've looked at the Beatitudes, the words that Jesus spoke at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. We've been looking at those Beatitudes through the lens of the family. And we're asking God to teach us to live according to his words so that he can bless our homes. So they can bless our lives, so that he can bless our families. And the idea is we don't want to settle for being a cultural Christian. We don't want to settle for a cultural Christianity, meaning we are Christian in name only. I mean, there's no evidence that a cultural Christian family is dedicated to Christ and His Word on any level. That's not the life that we want to live. Uh, and yet we believe uh, seriously that God has called us to a much greater commitment. And uh, we've been talking about that. The fact that Jesus doesn't want to just be a peripheral part of our lives. That's not his desire at all. I mean, in a Christ-centered home, Jesus Christ will be central in, in our lives. And, and we believe that when Christ is central, everything we say and do will be influenced by our relationship with him. That's where I hope you're living today. When Christ is central in our lives and our families, there'll be evidence to those around us that something's different. And when I say something's different, I'm not talking about odd or weird different. I'm talking about something is uniquely, beautifully different. Something is desirably different about our lives. Because when our life is centered on Christ, it, it will change us on several levels. It'll change us in the way that we think. It'll change the way we act. It'll change the way that we live. And when you have a true encounter with Christ, that's exactly what transpires. That's what happens. When Christ is central in our lives, our values will be different. The way that we raise our children will be different. The way that we spend our time will be different. The way that we spend our money, it'll be different when Christ is at the heart and when Christ is central. Uh, God has called us to a better way of life. We believe that. And so um, I, here's what I want you to guard against. And I see this happen almost every week, if not every day that I live. And uh, it happens out in society and culture. I see it all the time. I see it happening in the church. When people have a tendency to say, Lord, here's the life I've chosen to live. It is inconsistent with your word. It is inconsistent with your will. Now, would you bless my life? And then they wonder why God doesn't bless that. When God has already said, here's the life that I'll bless. And so instead of asking God to bless the life you're living, why not instead choose to live the life he's already promised to bless? 
That's my challenge to you today in this series. Instead of saying, Lord, bless this life that I'm living, this life that may be inconsistent with your word and your will on several different levels, instead, I'm going to choose to live my life according to the way that you've already said you're going to bless it in your word. I'm going to live a Christ-centered life. So before we leave this series and before we move on from the Beatitudes, there's one more thing you need to know. If you're living a Christ-centered life, if, if you desire a, a Christ-centered family, there's something you need to know. And um, I'll just be up front with you right here at the beginning and tell you this is not good news. What I, what I need to tell you today, it is not good news. It is something you need to know, something you will not want to know, but you need to know. Okay, and I know that's not a great advertisement. And you're thinking, I'm not sure, I'm glad I'm here. But uh, this is something that you need to know. And that is the fact that according to Scripture, as a Christian living a Christ-centered life, you will, mark my words, you will face persecution. You will be persecuted for living the life Christ has called you to live. Christ-centered individuals, Christ-centered families can testify that it'll be so. Now, it's difficult to say what that persecution may look like for you and your family. Um, you could be mocked, you may be ridiculed, you may be made fun of. Most of us have uh, you know, experienced that level of persecution, I guess, if you even want to call it that, um, for something much less than, than a decision to follow Christ. Maybe we were made fun of or ridiculed for the way we looked, or maybe where we lived, or where, what we drove, or the clothes we wore, or who knows what. But... Um, you know, there are those that are persecuted on some level for their faith in Jesus Christ. And if you know anything about the kind of persecution people around the world today are facing for their faith, I got to tell you, it's kind of embarrassing to even mention the persecution uh, that people around the world face with us saying things like, eh, I was mocked, I was made fun of, I was condemned, ridiculed, put down, whatever, uh, when Christians are actually being murdered for their faith in some parts of the world. But still, it's persecution, and we need to talk about that. But um, I think we couldn't pass by without stopping to say that, uh, you know, Christians are dying in a greater measure than ever before for their faith today. Just last month, Pope Francis said that there are more persecuted Christians in the world today than there were in the first centuries of Christianity. And not only are they being persecuted, they are being killed. Uh, people are being put to death because of their faith in Christ. Now, while we realize that death is the ultimate level of persecution, what we're going to talk about today is significantly less than that. It's not on that same level at all for most. As a dedicated Christ follower, though, it's important that you know that persecution for you and me is likely if we're going to follow Christ. And so to take you back just a little, if we were to go back to week one in Matthew chapter five, verse six, just in the way of review, we said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. These are the words of Jesus. One of the first blessings that he spoke, the Beatitudes, which is a Latin word for blessing. One of the blessings that he spoke for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. Now, if you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness in an unrighteous world, People are going to laugh at you. People are going to make fun of you. There's a good chance you're going to face some level of persecution. Okay? Number two, in week number two, we talked about Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, if you're trying to live with a pure heart in a world that idolizes, and I mean literally idolizes impurity, then people are going to mock that. They're going to mock that kind of lifestyle. They're going to ridicule you for some of the things that you say and do. And so you need to understand that reality and be prepared for it. We're going to talk about how to do that this morning. Last Sunday, we looked at Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. You might as well face it, if you decide to forgive as you've been forgiven, if you decide to follow the words and the example of Christ, people are going to wonder what's wrong with you. What are you thinking? What are you doing? They're, they're not going to get it. They might even mock you or criticize you or condemn you for your decision. And so that brings us to the final passage in this series. And as I said, it's something you need to know but may not want to know. It's something that we need to hear, something that we need to understand. And it's found in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 10. Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. That doesn't even sound like fun, does it? Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Verse 12, he says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Persecution can actually be a good thing. I want you to think about this. See, persecution may reveal that you've been faithful to the cause of Christ because faithless people would go unnoticed. There's no need to persecute somebody when they blend into the ways of the world. There's no need to acknowledge that. I mean, Christ-centered individuals and families choose to live by a different set of values and the world doesn't get it. The world doesn't understand. It doesn't make sense to the world. That's what often leads to persecution. This is the person who decides to, you know, say, hey, I'm going to save sex before marriage. I'm going to wait. I'm going to maintain my purity. The world won't get that. And so their natural response is, we're going to criticize you. We're going to condemn you. That doesn't add up. This may be the person who decides that there are some things that they're not going to set before their eyes. There are going to be some things they won't watch. There there are going to be some movies that they just say, no, I'm not going to go there. Or they may even wind up there with a group of friends and they're sitting there and they're watching something. They say, you know what, I'm uncomfortable here and I'm going to get up and walk out and I'm going to not be rude or make a scene or make a spectacle, but I'm going to tell my friends, I'm not comfortable being here, so I'll meet you at a restaurant later on. I'm going to slip out now. That's the kind of person that said, hey, Christ is going to be central and there are going to be some things that I can't do or places that I won't go or things that I won't be a part of. Uh, just, um, <clears throat> this isn't just for kids and teenagers either. I, I have a feeling when I was working on this that maybe some people would hear it and say, well, you know, this is all about peer pressure and you know, I, I get it. And when the kids are young, somebody says, hey, let's do these things and they're tempted to go be a part of it and they really shouldn't and they need to stand up. But I, as an adult, I don't have to deal with that. It's not true. We do deal with it, even as parents. When we're talking about living the Christ-centered life, living by a different set of values, it's kind of like the parent who says, hey, my child won't be in that sports league that hinders or eliminates our involvement in worship, even for a season. We're just not doing it. Contemporary culture won't get it. You'll be criticized for a decision like that. That's because a Christ-centered life stands in stark contrast to the ways of the world. And whenever you swim against the current, whenever you turn on the light in a dark place, you will face persecution on some level. So just remember the Bible says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. If you're living a Christ-centered life, if you're pursuing righteousness, a level of persecution can be expected. You can just anticipate it. And so that raises the question, how do we prepare our families for persecution? I mean, how do we sink our roots deep in the faith and deep in Christ so much so that we can handle the inevitable persecution that's certainly going to come our way? I'm glad the kids are in here with us because I want moms and dads to be able to sit down and talk to some of the kids about these kinds of topics after you leave here today. Maybe it can be a conversation you have around lunch or maybe sometime this afternoon or sometime this week, something that you can talk about. How do we deal with it? How do we sink our roots of our faith deep enough that we can handle the storms of persecution that are coming our way? How do we prepare for persecution? Well, I'm going to give you three simple ways. These are things that you can do at your home starting today, this week, this month, this year, that you can do to handle persecution. Number one, you can teach them to expect it. Teach them to expect persecution. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. And uh, for those of you that are visiting with us, anytime uh, we give reference, uh, most of the time, to additional Scripture references, those are listed at the bottom of your worship folder so that you can do a little further study and research on those on your own. But 2 Timothy 3, 12, it says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, I just want to stop right there and say, look at that verse, think about that for just a minute, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. It doesn't sound like anybody gets off the hook. It doesn't sound like this is going to be easy. It doesn't sound like you can skate by or that you can fly under the radar. It sounds like to me without any study of the background or the original language or other translations or any of that, it just says everybody who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus is going to be persecuted. 
It just might as well say it. If you want to follow Christ, persecution's going to follow. That's going to come. If your family is Christ-centered in some way, you will be different. People won't understand. They won't get it. And you will be persecuted. You will be criticized on some level. That's the truth. See, in a Christ-centered family, your values are going to be different from the values of the world. And the, the way the world chooses to cope with those differences often is they'll just make fun of you. That's how we cope. We'll make fun of that which is different. It may be, you know, the, the family Thanksgiving dinner this year. Maybe you're the only believer in your family and all the siblings are together and all the cousins and the aunts and the uncles and you got a big group together and all of a sudden you notice that uh, there's some little snide remarks being made and little jabs that are coming your way because you feel like the family ought to pray together over the family dinner and because you're trying to do a, a Christian thing, it's easy to kind of mock that and make fun of it. Now, I'm not trying to equate that with being martyred for your faith. Don't get me wrong. But there is a sense of persecution, and I'll understand too that in a service like this, we can talk about it, and some of those things may seem really small in a service like this where we're all together and we're here for the same reason. But let me tell you, if you've been persecuted in some level, even though it may be light in many ways, when you go home tonight and you're at home by yourself and you think about the things that are said, Satan begins to whisper all kinds of things in your ear and all of a sudden what was a small thing begins to fester into a bigger thing. And you begin to feel uneasy. It may be the case where you're not invited to certain parties because if we invite her or if we invite him, they'll ruin the fun because of the things they've chosen not to do. You'll face a certain amount of ridicule or persecution. That's just a part of following Christ. Persecution in our country, relatively light, but it is increasing every day. And it might be wise for you to just stop and contemplate the fact that hostility toward Christianity and Christ's values uh, is growing, and you'd better understand now how important it is that you stand strong and teach your children to stand strong, because in all likelihood, things are not going to get any better. Things aren't going to get any better. In fact, I think a strong case could be made for things getting worse, much worse in the days ahead. So you better learn to stand now. It's wise to make sure that your roots go deep so that you're prepared to weather whatever storms may come your way. It's a wise thing to do. And I'll just say this, if you can't take a little criticism for your faith, I mean, if you cave in every time somebody makes fun of you for following Christ, how do you expect to stand when the winds of adversity begin to really blow? I mean, they don't blow right now in the United States, but when they really begin to blow, how do you ever expect to stand up to that? My concern is that very few of us know what real persecution looks like. And I'm not trying to be a pessimist, but given the condition of the world today, my expectation is that persecution is going to increase, and it is wise to be prepared. It's wise to be prepared. Now, here's the thing. This is not just my idea. I don't want you to think, man, what got under his, you know, what bird got under his saddle? Uh, you know, what's up with the preacher today? Why is he so uptight? Hey, listen to me. This is not my idea. I want you to look what Jesus said in John chapter 15, uh, verse 18 through 20. This is some extremely strong language. If the world hates you, it could have, you know, the translators could have come away and said, hey, if the world has a problem with you, or if the, the world is troubled by you, or if the world's uncomfortable with you, or if they think you're a little odd or unique or different, it says if the world hates you, if the world hates you, there are people that will hate you because you bear the name of Christ. Keep in mind that it hated me first, Jesus said. Verse 19, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you, Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Folks, <clears throat> it doesn't sound like there's any way around it. I mean, when it comes right down to it, it doesn't sound like there's any way around it. So when it comes to persecution, it just seems wise to me to prepare your family and say, teach them to expect it. That's, that's the first thing you can do with persecution. Second thing, teach them to endure it. Teach them to endure persecution. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, Paul says, we work hard with our hands. When we are cursed, we bless. And when we are persecuted, what do we do? We endure it. When we're persecuted, we endure it. There's no need to whine about it. No need to cry about it. 
No need to gripe and complain about why it's not fair. As I keep saying again and again, we know that the persecution we endure in this country is incredibly light compared to what goes on in the world. But in some places, family members are totally disowned for following Christ. You become a Christian, you choose to accept Christ, you choose to be a Christ follower, they will treat you like you don't exist. They will turn their backs on you. You're not welcome in their home. They won't speak to you. Most of us have never experienced anything like that. Even worse, the people around the world who are giving their lives for their faith in Christ each and every day, we're seeing reports of people being martyred for their faith. And, and perhaps some of these stark realities can help you to just endure it a little more when somebody makes fun of you for maybe going on a mission trip over spring break instead of going down to the beach to party. You know, we, do, we take all this stuff so personal and it's such a big deal, but it helps to keep it in perspective. When people ridicule or condemn you or make fun of you because you live by a different set of values, a different set of standards, you just endure it. You pray for them and you endure it. I'm actually convinced that there are times that those who are doing the persecuting, I believe that often they wish they had the courage themselves to stand up. I think sometimes they wish they had the backbone, but they've given in to the peer pressure and they're swimming with the current and they cope by condemning those who are living the life that they wish they had the courage to live. When you endure persecution rather than give in to it, I am convinced that something amazing happens in our hearts. God does something inside of you. I'm convinced that that when you endure persecution, your spiritual roots actually go deeper. Something mystical and amazing and and spiritual happens in our lives because when you endure persecution, your intimacy with Christ increases, your spiritual life, um, your resolve, it is strengthened. It goes to a different level. When you stand up, it'll strengthen your faith and it'll serve as a reminder that we are not living for the approval of man. We are living for the approval of God. We've decided to live for Him. And when you decide to live a God-honoring life, you're going to face persecution. And if you've never been persecuted, it's almost a disadvantage. I mean, it's, it's almost a disadvantage. The fact that there's no persecution where we live, it almost puts us at a spiritual disadvantage because throughout history, when the church is persecuted or when Christians are persecuted, the church and Christians get stronger. That's what happens in the midst of persecution. When Christians are persecuted, they get stronger. It has application for your family. I mean, when your family stands together for Christ and persecution comes your way, it draws you closer to God, it draws you closer together, and and you get stronger. That's just what happens. When family identity is strong, peer pressure is weak. But they also say when family identity is weak, peer pressure is strong. That's why it's so important for parents as you're raising your kids to be aware that persecution will come and they need to endure it. They need to to expect it. When there's a a deep grounded spiritual identity and when there's a strong family identity, even though you face pressure, it's not as strong as it might have been because now you have a purpose. Now you have support and values and, and an anchor to hold you steady in the midst of the storm. You can tell your family, hey, we're gonna face persecution. You might as well expect it. And you know what? When it comes, we're also going to endure it. But the third thing you need to tell them, and this one will sound odd at first, we're going to embrace it. We're going to embrace it. And let me tell you why. This is not easy, but it can give you an incredibly unique perspective on persecution if you will learn to embrace it. You just thank God that you get to suffer some, in some small way for Jesus You get to suffer like Jesus who gave it all for you. That's that's why we embrace persecution. Persecution is going to come and we embrace it. See, Peter was talking to a group of Christians that were suffering and they were being persecuted beyond anything you could ever imagine. And I decided not to get graphic because I knew the kids were going to be here. But I'm telling you, it was graphic. And some stuff that would make you sick and stuff that would shock you. They were being persecuted. And look what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. He says, dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial. And that's almost an understatement given the circumstances. The painful trial you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But he says, rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And then in verse 14, it says, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and God rests on you. 
the Spirit of glory and of God rest on you. Peter creates no illusion. God's plan for your life may include pain. It may include hardship. You will face persecution, but don't be surprised when trouble comes. He goes on in verse 16. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. If you suffer as a Christian, don't be surprised, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Peter lived what he preached. Peter and John had been persecuted and they were persecuted for preaching the good news. They'd been warned repeatedly, don't preach in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't talk about the name. But they continued in spite of the threats. And over in Acts chapter 5, Peter and the apostles, they were beaten and told, don't do it. We've told you, we've warned you, quit doing that. And after they'd been beaten and released from prison, I want you to see what they said in Acts chapter 5 verse 41. The apostles left the Sanhedrin where they'd been meeting with these leaders, rejoicing. Now that's not the word you would expect, but they were rejoicing because they've been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name that's with a capital N it's talking about Jesus have you ever thought of persecution as a blessing as something worth rejoicing about I mean this beating suffered by Peter and John was the first time any of the apostles had, had been physically abused for their faith and Peter and John knew how Jesus had suffered and because they knew how Jesus had suffered, they praised God that he had allowed them to be persecuted as well. So the next time somebody's making fun of you for, you know, saying a prayer over lunch at school, would it change anything to remember how Christ has suffered for you? I mean, would that make a difference when your colleagues are making fun of you for being faithful in your marriage and and not doing some of the things they're doing, would that make a difference for you if you just understood what persecution really looked like and what Christ has done on your behalf? Would that make a difference when you're upholding a higher standard or when you're going home to your family when everybody else is going out? Would that make a, a difference? Would it make a difference when you're telling the truth or walking away from a deal that would have required you to say or do something unethical? See, so are you able to rejoice because you have been counted worthy of suffering because of your relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you able to embrace persecution and thank God for it? Matthew 5.10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's a new paradigm, folks. It's, it can change the way you look at the trials and tribulations that come your way in life. Now, now, don't blame consequences of your bad choices on persecution and say, hey, I'm being persecuted. Sometimes our suffering is self-inflicted. But when you stand up for Jesus and when you face persecution, you can consider it a blessing to be able to identify with Christ. The truth is that sometimes things go wrong because you're doing something right. That could be happening in your life today. Things go wrong because you're doing something right. You don't hear it from the prosperity teachers on television, but that's the reality if you want to look at God's Word in its entirety. There are times that when you're doing the right thing, things are going to go wrong, but don't settle for being a blend-in, average, cultural Christian family because God has called us to something more. He has called us to something better. And so in this series, I've been just trying to challenge you for four weeks. Folks, let's not be a culturally Christian family. I want to live a Christ-centered life. Don't you? Isn't that our desire? To live a Christ-centered life, a Christ-centered existence? We're going to close this series and this service by sharing together in communion. They're making preparation now to come and distribute the elements that you're going to receive right there at your seat. As we do that, I want you to know that here at the point, we serve what is known as open communion. And what that means is that you don't have to be a member of this local church to participate it's open to everybody who names Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you feel like you can't say that that's where you're living today, then uh, you're welcome to just pass that tray on. Don't feel obligated to participate. But if you don't know Christ as your Savior, before we close this service and before we distribute those elements, you may want to change that. Because there's a God in heaven who loves you with an unconditional love. And he sent his son Jesus to die for your sins and for mine. And he extends to you a gift, and it's the gift of eternal life, and it's available to all who call upon the name of the Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what it says in Romans. 
We're going to serve this communion as a reminder that Jesus Christ shed his blood and gave up his body for you and me. That's the symbol of the bread and the cup. If you have children with you, I encourage you to try to be seated near them or with them so that you can participate together. Um, As far as how old your children need to be before they participate, we ask parents to guide your kids when you feel like they're old enough to understand the meaning and significance of what we're doing here today. Um, You'll be able to participate uh, at your leisure, once you've received the elements, any time during the next couple of songs, you can participate together. I will not be coming back up to instruct you any further. So when you're ready and you feel like your heart is prepared, you can receive those elements. And then we'd ask that you hold your cups, uh, the empty cups, to be placed in the receptacles as you leave the sanctuary today. Would you bow with me, please, as we pray and as we prepare our hearts for this observance? Heavenly Father, I pray that through the power of your Spirit, you would help us to apply the truths that have been brought before us in this series these last few weeks. I pray that we would never be content with a cultural Christianity. We desire that our individual lives and the lives of our family be centered in Christ. May the way we think, the way we act, the way we live, give evidence to the fact that we are dedicated followers of Jesus Christ. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to talk to you for just a moment. When we do a series like this that we've just finished today, my hope, my prayer, the prayer of our team that works together on these services is that somehow God will have moved the needle forward in your spiritual life in some way. I pray that that has been the case in this Bless This Home series. And as we come to the conclusion, as we pray together, I want to ask you, are there personal commitments that you need to make to God today? Is it time for you to step across the line and become a first-time follower of Jesus Christ? Do you need to renew a commitment that's been left on the shelf for far too long in your relationship with God? I believe it's possible that over the past few weeks, some might have come to the conclusion that you've been Christian, but in name only. And you've sensed God calling you to a deeper walk, and you want your life and your family's life to be committed to Christ on a deeper level. I want you to just tell the Lord what's on your heart today, whatever that is. And I would tell you these altars are always open for you to come and pray. And and I would pray that husbands and fathers would lead the way. If your family needs to be at this altar, if you need to be at this altar, you lead the way and come. and, And you can bring the elements with you and you can pray together and then receive those elements after you're done. But my prayer is that our life would be a witness to God's mercy and His love and His grace. And so as we continue on in worship and as we prepare to receive these elements on our own, I pray, Lord, that you would bless this time, bless these elements that we're about to receive, reminders of the incredible sacrifice you made for our sin. You died that we might live. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving our families. Thank you for making it possible for us to experience the blessings of life in Christ here and throughout eternity. We pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. May God bless you.